All right, so we're diving into Canadian history and identity today. And get this, our starting point is a $20 bill. I love it. It's amazing how something we use every day, something most people probably glance at without really thinking about, can actually reveal so much about a nation's story. And we've got some fascinating material to dig into, textbook excerpts, a focus on First Nations perspectives, plus insights into those French and British influences that are kind of, well, inseparable from the story of Canada. But let's start by picturing that $20 bill in our minds. Bilingual right off the bat. English and French. Which I think immediately raises a question about what we choose to include and exclude when we talk about Canadian identity. Why these two languages? And what does that say about, say, the historical complexities with First Nations languages? It's really interesting how these everyday objects like currency can spark those kinds of conversations. And you're right, the language choice on the Canadian 20 it really does reflect these larger debates around cultural recognition and representation that are always going on. And then there's the image that's hard to avoid, at least on the $20 bill. Queen Elizabeth II can't escape a little royal watching, even 2024, right? <laughs> but seriously, why is she there? What does it say about Canada's relationship with the monarchy? Especially compared to, you know, our neighbors to the south who made a different choice, so to speak. Right. And that's a perfect example of what we call visual rhetoric. It's more than just putting an image on a bill. The size of the image, the placement, even the style, they all send a message about what's valued, about who holds a prominent place in the national story. And it makes you think the fact that the queen is front and center, she's larger. While the artwork of Bill Reed, the celebrated Haida artist, is smaller and off to the side, it kind of suggests a hierarchy of importance in how Canadian identity was being presented, at least when this bill was designed. And you know what I find really interesting? It's like the bill itself is trying to tell the story, a story about Canadian diversity. You've got Reed representing the Indigenous experience. You've got Gabrielle Roy, the Francophone author, adding another layer. But is it a complete picture? That's the question, isn't it? And it takes us beyond just the design choices, the aesthetics, and into something deeper, the realm of historical narratives. Because who gets to decide which stories get told, even on something as seemingly insignificant as a $20 bill? And even more importantly, whose stories might be missing from that telling, whose voices are not being heard? So this whole discussion about what we choose to put on the $20 bill yeah. kind of leads us to this really crucial question that came up in those textbook excerpts you shared. Who belongs to Canada and who doesn't? Mm. And it's a powerful question. I mean, it really forces us to confront all the complexities of Canadian identity, don't you think? Absolutely. It really challenges that idea we might have of a single Canadian history. Like there's one narrative, one experience, and that's it. And it really highlights how important it is to hear those different voices, those different perspectives. Because ultimately there are multiple narratives, right? Yeah. I mean, multiple perspectives on the same event, mm. which takes us back to that $20 bill. Yeah. And makes you think, whose version of the story is actually on there mm -hmm. and whose experiences maybe aren't being fully represented or maybe even missing altogether. Exactly. And it's about understanding what we call historical narratives, who gets to shape those narratives, who traditionally has held that power. And then how do those narratives in turn end up shaping how we see the past? For example, think about the artwork on the bill showcasing those English and French Canadian perspectives. Well, that's a direct result of decades of debate and negotiation in Canada, decades of arguing about language, about cultural recognition. You know, it's funny. It makes me think about my own family. We're like a hodgepodge of cultures mm -hmm. and holiday gatherings. Let me tell you, they're like a master class in conflicting narratives. Same events, but completely different memories all depending on who's telling the story, who's remembering it. Oh, absolutely. It's so true. And just like those different perspectives shape our family stories, they shape those bigger stories, those national narratives we see reflected in something like the design of a $20 bill. So we have these different narratives, these different voices, kind of all vying for space, yes. both on that $20 bill and within the larger story of Canada itself. Mm -hmm. But how does that actually play out in the present day? How does that impact us today? That's where this idea of living history comes in. It's understanding that the past isn't just gone. It's not static or fixed. It continues to have an impact on us, on how we live. It shapes our attitudes about culture. It affects policies. It even shapes how we see ourselves and how we see others. Mm -hmm. And the textbook actually makes this really interesting parallel between personal and national identity. This idea that both are really molded by our past experiences. And I was thinking about all those historical tensions we've been talking about, those often fraught relationships between different cultural groups in Canada. How do those actually manifest themselves in Canada today? That's the heart of it all, isn't it? We see it in very real ways, like yeah. the ongoing journey of reconciliation 
with First Nations peoples, a journey that really requires us to acknowledge the harms that were caused by things like colonial policies and to address those harms. So it's much bigger than just apologies or financial settlements. It's about really grappling with these deeper systemic issues. Precisely. Reconciliation is definitely an ongoing process, and it demands a fundamental shift in how Indigenous peoples and the Canadian state relate to one another. It's about recognizing Indigenous rights Mm. and respecting treaties and ultimately working toward a future that's more just and more equitable for all Canadians. And it occurs to me that this idea of living history, it's not limited to Canada's relationship with its Indigenous peoples. It really applies to all those cultural threads that make up the nation, don't you think? Absolutely, you're right. The relationship between French and English Canadians is a perfect example. All those historical tensions that have existed between those two language groups, well, they continue to impact Canadian politics and identity today. That's why there's such a focus on things like bilingualism in government policy and why it's still so present in public conversations today. It really makes you wonder, If we were to redesign that $20 bill today, what would we even put on it? What symbols, what stories would truly represent this multifaceted, ever-evolving idea of Canadian identity? It's a huge challenge, isn't it? How can you possibly capture all of that complexity, the entire history of a nation and the incredible diversity of its people, all in just a single image? or even a handful of symbols. I mean, it's almost like asking someone to define what it even means to be Canadian in the 21st century. And that's the thing. There isn't one answer because it's a tapestry, isn't it? A tapestry of different experiences and perspectives and stories. All woven together. Exactly. And, you know, that's maybe the most important takeaway from our conversation today, that Canadian identity isn't fixed or absolute. It's fluid and it's constantly changing and being renegotiated. And that's what makes it so fascinating to think about and to discuss. So we've been talking about living history and how the past isn't just over and done with. It's still very much shaping the present. And you mentioned that we really see this in Canada's journey of reconciliation with First Nations peoples. What does that living history actually look like in that specific context? Well, it's about recognizing that the legacy of colonialism and particularly the residential school system, it continues to have a huge impact on indigenous communities even today. And we see this in so many ways, the intergenerational trauma, the loss of language and culture, the ongoing struggles for self-determination. So it's much more than just, say, apologies or financial settlements. It's about addressing these deeper issues, these systemic issues that are rooted in historical injustices. Exactly. Reconciliation is an ongoing process for sure. And it demands a really fundamental shift, a shift in the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the Canadian state, between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous Canadians. It's about recognizing Indigenous rights and respecting treaties and working towards a future that's truly just and equitable for everyone. I'm realizing as you're talking that this idea of living history isn't just relevant to Canada's relationship with its indigenous peoples. It really applies to all those different cultural threads that make up the nation. Absolutely. I mean, look at the French-English dynamic, for example. All those historical tensions that have existed between those two language groups, well, they're still shaping Canadian politics and identity today. I think that's why we still see such a big focus on bilingualism in government policy and even just in our everyday conversations. It makes me wonder, you know, if we were to actually sit down and redesign that $20 bill today, What would we even put on? I mean, what symbols or stories could actually represent this idea of Canadian identity, especially given that it's so multifaceted and it's always evolving? It's the challenge, isn't it? How do you capture all of that, a nation's entire history and the incredible diversity of its people and somehow sum it all up in a handful of images or symbols? It almost feels like we're asking, what does it even mean to be Canadian in the 21st century? And you know what? There's no one answer to that question because ultimately it's a tapestry, right? A tapestry of experiences and stories and perspectives all woven together. All these different threads. Exactly. And if there's one thing we can take away from today's conversation, It's that Canadian identity isn't this fixed thing. It's fluid and it's contested and it's always being renegotiated. And that's what makes it so fascinating to explore. It's been amazing to unpack all of this with you today. Who knew that a simple $20 bill could lead to such a fascinating conversation about history and identity and belonging? I think it just goes to show you that the most unexpected objects can spark really insightful conversations. And hey, next time you find yourself holding a $20 bill, Maybe take a second look. You never know what stories might be hiding in plain sight. Until next time, keep those minds curious and those conversations flowing.